depth using Fitzroy as its base. The assault ship Intrepid would first take the Scots guards there. Halfway, the ship's captain decided it was too dangerous to go on and ordered the guards to complete the journey in small assault boats. Ewan South Vitalia, the landing craft commander, had serious doubts. I knew we had an advance ahead of us, probably an eight-hour journey without charts. And it's not the good thing to say as a junior or as a, as a marine major to turn to the foreign captain of a capital ship in his own bridge and said, I'm sorry, sir, but I think the whole thing stinks. And he said, I didn't really think you should speak to me like that, and quite rightly. And I said, well, one thing, if this doesn't work, I want you to remember those are my last words to you. We were launched in uh, assault boats in the middle of the night to complete the journey uh, into Bluff Cove. Uh, as we did so, the weather got worse and worse, the waves got higher and uh, the wind got stronger. Uh, there was lashings of water all over the place. Without warning, the four landing craft came under fire. South Vitalia's worst fears had been realized. Suddenly we saw a uh, warship approach us. Uh, it started lobbing illuminating shells over us. We hadn't a clue whether it was friend or foe. Eventually, we discovered that this was a naval ship from the task force. It didn't know that we were going to be there. We didn't know it was going to be there. And I guess that's what you call the fog of war. At dawn, as the guards' assault boats closed in on Fitzroy, an Argentine observation post some miles away on Mount Harriet spotted them. They feared a new British landing had begun. De los movimientos que había en tierra. It seemed to me that because of the movement on the ground, they were disembarking troops and supplies. So I immediately notified Port Stanley that a landing was taking place. The Scots guards went ashore after eight weary hours at sea. British commanders decided it would be safer to send the Welsh guards waiting at San Carlos in a bigger landing ship, Sir Galahad. But there was no way of communicating this between San Carlos and Fitzroy. No one in Fitzroy knew about this plan. And at dawn, the person who woke me up said, you and I think you can believe this, but Galahad is, is now at anchor alongside us. And I rushed up, and there she was, full of half the Welsh Guards. Anchored at Fitzroy Cove with Sir Galahad was her sister ship, Sir Tristram, which had sailed round packed with ammunition. The two were prime targets for enemy aircraft. I saw two vessels from Pleasant Bay. I requested planes to try and stop the landing. South Betalia quickly climbed aboard Sir Galahad and urged senior officers from the guards to get their men ashore. And I said, well, look, my advice as the task force landing craft squadron commander, you must get off and uh, he wasn't interested, and he saw that I was a major. And uh, he said, no, I don't take orders from Romney majors. I said, oh, for God's sakes, and my advice to you is you must get off. But it was too late. Skyhawk jets led by Brigadier Ruben Zini were closing in. We were flying very low. Second Lieutenant Gomez, the youngest officer in the group, sighted one of the ship's masts, but not the hull because it was hidden by the hill. The result was an excellent attack, where we caught both English ships by surprise. Both ships were hit. On board Sir Galahad, it was mayhem. two ships being bombed and I felt a rage I'd never felt before in my life, ever. These were our own men and of course, to my mind, it had been totally avoidable. Sir Galahad's ammunition blew up. The Welsh guards were engulfed by the inferno.
and I ran down to the beach about a quarter of a half mile away to find people already coming ashore, badly wounded, and I then stripped on shirt sleeves and carried stretchers for, for an hour or so. We did what we could for them. They came off the ship. We, we tried to patch up those that, that we could. That one was hit twice when we were in the back. From Mount Harriet, Colonel Arroyo had a bird's eye view. It makes you say, well, I'm at war. This is not a movie. I saw that action as something happening at a distance. Perhaps I get emotional when I think about it now, but then I couldn't think of the English soldiers that were burning. At the Ajax Bay Field Hospital, Chief Surgeon Rick Jolly could barely cope with the wounded. Helicopter after helicopter arrived at Ajax Bay and disgorged these loads of Welsh Guardsmen, the majority of whom had 10% um, flash burns. In other words, they only had skin hanging off the hands and faces. <laughs> I gave up counting after 100. I told the divisional headquarters, we need help. And to my surprise, the divisional headquarters said, why? When I told them how many casualties I had already, and I estimated it at 130, um, they were stunned. And I had to go to these young Welsh guardsmen and say to them, I'm sorry, I can't treat you. We've got um, too many of you. And yet these young Welshmen all said to me in their sing-song voices, don't worry about me, sir. You look after my mate. Have you seen him? Ellis, Evans, Williams. And they marched off into the night without a word of complaint. Even now, it makes me feel so proud. Two landing ships were smoking wrecks, and the Welsh guards were broken as a serious fighting force before they'd fired a single shot. The disaster at Bluff Cove cost the lives of 50 men, with 150 wounded. 